I'm Rick Edelman. How will recent changes in tax law impact you? Plus, a sci-fi medical gadget is on the verge of becoming reality. Change happens all the time, but are you riding the wave of change or drowning under it? All that and much more on this edition of The Truth About Money. program is funded in part by TD Ameritrade. At TD Ameritrade, we support investors and independent registered investment advisors every day, providing access to tools, research, and educational resources that help you pursue your goals with confidence. I'm Ed Burns. I've spent a lot of time around cameras. However, I've never actually swallowed one before. Till now. It's a camera the size of a pill that lets your doctor see inside of you. That's uh, kind of awesome. Technology is evolving. We believe the way to invest should evolve as well. A prospectus is available at 1-800-iShares, which includes investment objectives, risks, fees, expenses, and other information that you should read and consider carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. I'm Rick Edelman. You pay taxes, right? Is there a way for you to cut your tax bill? The answer is dollars and cents. I'm a freelance writer. How will the changes in the new tax code affect my itemized deductions? The only one that's likely to affect you as a freelancer is the home uh, deduction. If you deduct the costs of your home, if you have a home office, you might find it increasingly difficult to qualify for that deduction. That's not so much a change in the tax law that is responsible for this, but a change in IRS attitude about this. Very often, many people take a tax deduction for business use of their home, and they violate the rules. They don't use that space in their home exclusively for the business. It can't be part-time. It has to be totally devoted to the business. And it has to be a spot in the home where the business could not otherwise be conducted. Freelance writers, uh, I think you could do what you do at Starbucks just as easily as you do it in a library in your home. So aside from the home office deduction, I'm not so sure that the tax code is going to have any direct impact on you, or at least no more of an impact on you than it is on virtually every other American. The key is this. As a self-employed individual, you are responsible for your financial future. You need to make sure that you are creating a retirement account for yourself because you don't have an employer doing it for you. The bad news is you gotta do it all on your own. The good news is you have greater flexibility than most people who have jobs. You can put away more money than they can and get an even bigger tax deduction than most Americans. And I sure hope you'll take advantage of all of that. Celebrities are just like you and me, or at least their financial questions are. We go from New York to LA to ask just one question of our celebrity friends. Does celebrity always equal financial success? Well, my wife Sandy dated Elvis for six years, and I was at the radio station the night Elvis was discovered in Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis could have used some money advice as a matter of fact. And also as a matter of fact, his uh, wife Priscilla, after his death, made a huge success of Graceland. It was her idea to open it up, uh, you know, in, to the public. And uh, it does now over $100 million a year. When Elvis died, he only had six or seven million dollars in the bank. Do you save but wonder if you're saving enough? Well, you're not alone. Here's that question from a recent seminar in Frederick, Maryland. Our family, well, me, I do the finances. I was quite obsessed with saving. We max my husband's 401k out. I don't have one. I work part-time. IRA done, college every month, some, not, you know, in, into a 529. And we have a, two savings accounts. You have a, you're doing a really good job at saving. Yeah. You're maxing up the 401k account in your husband's workplace. You're saving in 529s for the kids. You are building up savings elsewhere. You're doing all those really good things. But let me ask you the question. Are you saving enough 
to achieve the goals that you and your husband have? I'm not certain. I know you're not certain. It was a loaded question. And the reason you're not certain is for two reasons. Number one, you haven't decided what those goals are. Definitively. Kind of, we, we want to get kids into college, and we want to get them married, and we want to retire one day. But those aren't goals. Those are dreams. A goal is when you specify the dream, and you put a date and a dollar amount on it. I want to retire at age 65 with an annual income of 100,000. That's a goal. Mm -hmm. The dream is I'd like to retire and go surfing. But we need to turn the dream into a specific goal. And until you have the specific goal, we don't know how much money you need to save within the allotted time available to get there. And we don't know how much of a rate of return we need to earn on that savings. Is 1% per year enough? Or do we need to earn 10% per year or something in between? So you need to sit down with your husband and figure out the goals. Mm -hmm. What are we doing all this for? Why did we have children? <laughs> Why are we working? Why are we living here? What is the point of all of this? What is the goal? What happens next? Remember George Carlin's old line when he talked about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They looked at each other and they said, this can't be it. There's got to be something that comes next. And that's what you and your husband need to figure out. If you have struggles figuring out your goals, that's what a financial advisor can help you do, is to say, look, let's figure out what your future holds. What do you want to be when you grow up? Let's figure that out, and then we can devise a plan to get you from here to there to answer a question that you haven't even asked. Is it possible that you and your husband are actually saving too much money? You're working too hard. Because if we can identify relative to your goals that the amount of level of savings you're doing is more than needed, now you can back off a little bit and some of the money that's going to savings can now go to current lifestyle and you can start to enjoy yourself a little more. Money might not feel so tight. And now all of a sudden you and your family can start having a little more fun, yet still having the confidence you're gonna to get to the goals you've laid out. So you're doing the hard part that most people don't do, which is saving like crazy. Now we need to tweak it so that you're saving efficiently. And next, we need to figure out what's the game plan and how do we get there. That's what the financial planning world's all about. Thank you. You're welcome. And here's another question from my seminar. Uh, my question is about pensions and 401k. Over the last 20 years, companies have basically phased out pensions. Um, we've also seen the poverty amongst elderly and who retirees increase. Now, the new thing is changing the frequency of the company contributions to 401k. Uh, it used to be with your every pay period. Now it's monthly, quarterly, and some are actually moving to annual contributions. Do you think this is going to be a trend going forward? And do you think it's going to have, you know, longer ramifications? Because 401ks and pensions were kind of like the easy way of saving money because it forced you to do it. Company had the structure in place. I mean, do you think more people are going to be in poverty, are going to be struggling to retire at a decent age? Or when they do retire, they're going to have to, you know, get food stamps. I mean, they can't afford to live off of what's left over. The change you're describing in employer contributions to a 401k is not going to have an adverse impact on the worker in a significant way. There will be a small, subtle impact. We know that the sooner the money gets invested, the faster it'll grow because the financial markets tend to rise in value. So sure, putting the money in on a monthly basis is better than putting it all in in December. But since we're gonna be putting it in over multiple Decembers, over decades, it's still gonna have the relatively uh, similar benefit. So no, it's not going to matter a whole lot. Where I get concerned is when people are contributing to the 401k only to the extent that they qualify for the employer match. The typical employer in this country has a 3% match on a 6% savings balance. In other words, the boss will put in 50 cents on the dollar up to uh, 6%, meaning if you contribute 6% of your pay, the boss will put in 3% for a match for a total of nine. Does that sound familiar? Very, very common. And very often, people will contribute only to the 6% level because that's the extent that they get the match. And they stop at that point. And there are actually some people who claim to be financial experts who say that's what you should do. Because if you do six and they do three, you just made 50% on your money before it even got invested. If you do 10 and they do three, you've only got a 33% return 
and 50% is better than 33%, so stop at six. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard because I'd rather have 13% saved than 9% saved. Does that make sense? So you should be contributing to your retirement account to the maximum your boss allows. And it's different with every company depending on the 401k rules and compliance testing and all the details uh, that pertain to 401ks. But if your boss allows you to do 15% of your pay, then that is what you should do. The fact that your boss only matches to 3% or in some cases doesn't match at all, so what, not relevant, you need to participate to the maximum you can. The concern that I have is that many workers are not aware of this fact and they are not participating at all or they are not participating in the correct funds and as a result, they aren't accumulating as much money as they should be toward retirement. And because they're not doing that, we get to the scenario you described, which is millions of Americans reaching retirement with insufficient amounts of money, and they enter retirement, or they soon after entering retirement find themselves in poverty. That is a huge social issue and getting worse as we go. Fortunately, there is a solution around the corner. And the solution is coming to us via technology. We are living longer than ever, and we are healthier than ever. The notion of traditional retirement is fast disappearing. Retirement, we will discover, was an innovation of the 20th century. It did not exist prior to the 20th century, and I do not believe that it will exist in the 21st century. You will not reach age 65 and retire with a gold watch, a pension, a paid off mortgage, and a life expectancy of three years. That's what happened in 1955 but that's not the case today. Instead, at age 65, you will quit what you're doing and you will go back to school and learn a new skill and you will re-enter the workforce in a completely new field, perhaps at a dramatically lower income. However, it will be sufficient given your social security income, your 401k assets, uh, and other savings. And you will continually reinvent yourself because you will be as healthy in your 70s and 80s as today you are in your 40s and 50s. And you aren't going to want to play golf or garden all day long. You're going to get bored with those activities. You're going to want to stay productive and uh, an engaged member of society. And due to the innovation of technology, you'll be able to do so far longer, which means instead of fearing that here I am in my 50s with only 10 years to save for the future, you actually have 20 or 30 years to save for the future. And that will reduce the pressure that your fearing is going to otherwise occur. Umbrella Liability Insurance protects you from A, lawsuit judgments, B, a leaky roof, C, flood damage. We'll be back with the answer right after this. Did you ever notice that sci-fi shows have the coolest gadgets? Singularity University's Robin Farman Farmian shows us that the Star Trek tricorder is well on the way to becoming real. We really are in an exciting age. We're t dealing with the convergence of all these accelerating technologies. Things like artificial intelligence and robotics, computing systems and networks, nanotechnologies, how they're gonna relate to the next two, five, and 10 years in health and medicine, really bringing a lot of this healthcare home to the patient. One of the other fascinating elements is uh, the, what uh, Star Trek fans refer to as the tricorder. Absolutely. Uh, is that uh, pie in the sky or will we actually see that? That's gonna exist, absolutely. I, I believe there's about 20 or 22 teams right now with the XPRIZE. They have the tricorder going on right now. What it is, is, is a device that's going to be able to diagnose you better than a team of doctors. So you can bring this to a developing world and somewhere where the nearest doctor is a two day walk away and have this device. And how far away is that? That's now. And that means it'll be at a drugstore near you in the not too distant future. Hopefully. We're going to have all these quantified self devices, continuous monitoring in the home, we'll be able to catch diseases at stage one or even stage zero, reducing healthcare costs overall and allowing the patient to be in control and really be the key member on the healthcare team. Stage zero, what does that really mean? Catching things before they start. Imagine a platform where you have all of your quantified self data and understand your disease risks. You can then add in your environmental data, your age, your height, your weight, your sex, all the standards standard stuff, put it all together into one platform, but imagine having your own EMR, your own electronic medical record in your house, being able to analyze data on a continuous basis. Sensors in toilets and everything like that, uh, collecting it on uh, 
minute by minute basis. So uh, the body's waste is getting analyzed by the commode, yep. sending that data to your iPhone, and the iPhone analyzing this data using technology that Watson created to win in Jeopardy, and yep. then transmitting that data to your physician who says, hey, we need to alter your treatment plan. Exactly, and so this can happen at stage one or stage zero. I mean, you don't even have to be sick to have an internist who gets flagged all of a sudden. Your blood pressure is suddenly spiking for no reason. This suggests that medicine now becomes available to people who don't have ready access to a physician. I mean, if you're in a third world nation where doctors are scarce, all of a sudden due to the internet, that person somewhere in Africa can be in contact with a board certified physician in Boston. Not only do they have the connectivity now in developing nations, but we can bring in devices, things like MedSensation, which is a, a glove that has haptic technology and about 20 different sensors, being able to use that to diagnose uh, lumps in, in breast cancer. So bringing that to developing nations. Um, so you're suggesting that we would ship the glove to Africa. Exactly. Or put it on yourself, and the glove would be able to do the job that the physician used to do. Exactly. So essentially telepresence. Are we talking about the Jetson age, where this is 100 years from now? Or? We're talking about now. Right now, an EKG monitor that costs about 10 or $20 to make, it fits on an iPhone case. Bring that into a developing nation, start distributing this $10 case, and you'll be able to take EKGs, send the data up to the cloud, and be able to diagnose remotely, thousands of miles away. So if this technology is so readily available today, how come more of us aren't familiar with it? That's what we're doing. That's why FutureMed exists, because we want to get the word out to help enable all these physicians, healthcare executives, and the patients to be able to take control of the healthcare system. So really what you're suggesting is this is really a problem of information, letting people realize what is available, as opposed to innovation, the development of these things. It's, it's both, because right now we have a lot of these technologies. They still need to be combined. They need to be perfected. We're going to dramatically reduce the amount of money people are paying for stage three, stage four treatment programs. Exactly. What, 80% of the dollars spent in healthcare are on the 20% sickest. And Medicare believes by the year 2020, uh, healthcare costs are going to exceed $4.64 trillion. If we can bring this into the home and start catching diseases early, we'll be able to reduce that money. If I'm monitoring my own biofunctions by wearing a device on my belt, and it's mm -hmm. monitoring my metabolism and my caloric intake and how physical I am and translating that into a set of data that is being uploaded into my uh, smartphone, yeah. uh, isn't that a little bit of worry regarding privacy? So you've got, of course, people always worry about privacy, but there are laws surrounding that, and this can, data can be just for you. Or you can sign off things where your doctor has access to it, or your healthcare provider, or your mom. Robin, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. From robots to 4D printing, each week on The Truth About Money, we'll examine the financial implications of technologies like these and how they are reshaping our world. Umbrella Liability Insurance protects you from A, lawsuit judgments. Let's take a question from a listener of my weekly radio show. Let's head off to Baltimore. Bob's on the line. My question is, uh, my parents bought a uh, house uh, over 40 years ago, and my father last year had to go to a, uh, a home, actually living with a caretaker, and uh, we sold the house. My mother passed away eight years ago, and I wanted to see if, there, if we can increase the basis of the house when my mother passed away. Uh, since we no longer have uh, her $250,000 to offset the, uh, uh, the profits on the sale. Yeah, Bob, um, when your mother passed away, did your parents own the home uh, jointly? Uh, yes, they did. Okay. Then the answer is yes. When your mom passed away, uh, your father would have received a one-half step-up in cost basis when she passed. All right, let's, so, let's back up okay. because this is all confusing. Yeah. Let's say that uh, mom and dad own a house. The house is worth uh, half a million dollars. And they bought it for half a million, and it rises in value to 800000 um, Mom dies. So what's the cost basis? Well, six fifty. 
So your, <laughs> your, your math made me think, right? So the profit there went from 500 to 800 or 300,000. But half of that, or 150, is a step up. And that's why a lot of times when somebody passes away, it's a good idea to have the property appraised. So what you're going to need to do, Bob, is you're going to have to come up with a fair market value for the property around the time your mother passed away. Maybe you can look at um, whatever the county was valuing it. You need to talk to your tax advisor, but you're right in that you will receive a step up when your mom passed away. Now, wouldn't it in my math be that the, that the basis would rise by the half of the house that grew in value? So you're, you're saying the answer is 150 in, that, in my example. Well, yeah, because it's the profit that's getting stepped up. Gotcha. The amount of the profit. Okay, so the so the good news is this. If you own a house jointly with your spouse and one spouse dies, then the cost basis rises, so the future tax liability goes down. That's the good news. The bad news is a lot of people don't know this, and so they don't deal with it in a timely fashion. And as Brendan pointed out, you now have to go backwards eight years to try to find out what the value of that house was. Well, and this is also a risk if you think about adding your kids to the property before you die, because you're technically then gifting part of the house to them, which then they don't get that step up in basis when you die. So it's not a good idea to simply add kids to the property thinking, oh, well, it'll make it easier when I die. It'll actually cost them money. In other words, you're taking what would have been a tax-free gift to the children and turning it into a taxable event for the children. So uh, don't engage in do-it-yourself tax strategies or estate planning strategies because you don't know what you don't know. And it's better to get an advisor before you act uh, and say what you just said. Here's our situation. What's yeah. the best way to handle it? Uh, so uh, so there you go, uh, Bob. What you should do, as Brandon said, is talk with a tax advisor to uh, figure out exactly how to handle it right now. As a financial advisor, I believe managing money is no laughing matter, but comics at New York's Dangerfields Comedy Club have a different take on personal finance. I actually ate vegetarian for a long time when I was in college, not really out of virtue or love of animals, just so the meat prices were like just too high, you know what I mean? Like, I was total vegetarian too, man. And I can't stand like when people say they are a vegetarian when they're not, you know? I was on a date with a woman 10 years ago. We're like at a restaurant and she says to me, and I quote, you know, something you should know about me, I'm a vegetarian, but I will eat chicken if it's a special occasion. <laughs> I said, well, something you should know about me, I'm monogamous, but I will cheat if the opportunity presents itself. If you could ask a financial advisor just one question, what would it be? Here's one we hear from a lot of people. If you could give someone just one piece of financial advice, what would it be? Save as much as you can, save until it hurts, and save a little bit more. Um, seek out advice and, if, and know who you are. If you are not going to pay attention to your investments, you need to have someone do that for you. It would depend on what stage of life they were in, but uh, I think the single most uh, dramatic piece of advice would be to start saving early. Uh, I see a lot of people uh, actually entering retirement uh, and the ones that I see successfully entering retirement are people who got the message early on that they needed to make saving a part of their normal budget and to live below their means, um, not spend everything that comes in. Um, and those are the people that actually wind up having lots of options, lots of comfort in retirement. How can you put yourself at ease? My wife and business partner, Jean, gives us a little insight in the other side of money. If we look at change as a wave in the ocean, and if we're just um, body surfing, that's a heck of a lot more fun than if we're trying to uh, surf. Trying to get out into the ocean, that's when we're getting all beat up and, and all that. So it's, it's a lot easier to kind of go with the flow. Think about all the seasons as they change. You know, everybody's dreading winter. Well, baby, it's coming whether you like it or not. So embrace it, you know, put on an extra jacket or, uh, you know, put your hat and gloves on. It's coming. It's coming, you know what? And spring's coming and the pollen's coming. There's nothing you can do about it. So stop complaining and if you need to get away from the pollen, take your, take your medicine and, and move on. We get very comfortable with ourselves. We get so comfortable with our pattern, where we live, our jobs. And um, sometimes we just need to step out and, and 
do something different. So how about zip lining? Or how about trying to learn a different uh, sport? Something different that challenges ourselves. Go with the flow, ride the waves, embrace the change, enjoy the day. Thanks, Jean, for reminding us that this TV show is more personal than finance. And that's our show for today. I'm Rick Edelman. For The Truth About Money, see you next time. To learn more about the topics we discussed on this episode and a chance to ask your questions, visit our website at truthaboutmoneytv.com and stay connected by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter.